Welcome back. In this episode, I'd like to answer the question, what does the Bible say about marriage and divorce? To answer that question, we'll take a look at what the Old Testament has to say. Then we'll discuss the state of marriage and divorce in the first century among the Jews and Gentiles. And we'll wrap up the study by thinking about the the teachings of Jesus that we find, particularly in Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9. The Old Testament has a few things to say about marriage and divorce. God reveals his plan for marriage in Genesis chapter 2. As you may recall, Genesis 2 recounts the creation of man and woman. God created two biological sexes because it was not good for man to be alone. What that teaches us is men and women, male and female, in a marriage relationship, complement one another. We each have inherent weaknesses and strengths which work together, which complement each other to build a, a strong, cohesive marriage relationship. Now, Scripture consecrates the marriage relationship in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Scripture says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. As we'll see in a few minutes, Jesus quotes Genesis 2.24 when teaching on marriage and divorce. As far as divorce is concerned, Moses regulated divorce in the 24th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. In the first four verses of that chapter, Moses allowed men to divorce their wives. He says a man could divorce his wife because he has found some uncleanness in her. Now, what exactly that means is not clear. In fact, it was the subject of debate among rabbis for many, many years. What does some uncleanness mean? Setting that aside, what this passage shows us is that men living under the old law could divorce their wives if they did not measure up in some respect. They would give them a certificate of divorce and send them on their way. Now, the woman was free to remarry, but if her second husband divorced her, she could not return to her first husband and remarry him. That was considered an abomination in the eyes of God. Now, as far as the old law is concerned, that's the only passage we have that regulates divorce. In fact, the topic of marriage and divorce just isn't discussed a whole lot in the Old Testament until we get to Malachi chapter 2. Now, the prophet Malachi was prophesying sometime in the 5th century B.C. We can't be exactly certain when he was prophesying. While we can't be certain when exactly Malachi was prophesying, we do know that divorce was rampant among the Jewish people in his day. God was furious with how men treated their wives. He says three times in three verses that men were treating their wives treacherously. That's an interesting word treacherously. In fact, he goes so far to say in verse 16, for the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence. As anyone who's been through a divorce can attest, it is an emotionally violent act. Divorce leaves in its wake untold damage, and it's for this reason God hates divorce. He doesn't like divorce because it dissolves the union that he consecrated between man and woman, and he doesn't like divorce because of the harm it inflicts on one or both parties. Now, one might wonder, why did God even allow divorce in Deuteronomy chapter 24? If God hates divorce, why even allow it under the old law? Well, the answer to that's not clear, at least from the Old Testament, but I believe Jesus gives us some clarification on that when we get to his teaching. But before we jump into the teaching of Jesus, I want to just set the stage for a moment. I want to consider the the state of marriage and divorce in the first century among the Gentile and Jewish cultures. In the first century Roman world, the institution of marriage was in real trouble. The Emperor Augustus attempted to reform the institution during his reign. Unfortunately, his reforms did little to stem the tide of divorce during the first century. 
the historian Will Durant writes, Marriage had once been a lifelong economic union, but was now among a hundred thousand Romans a passing adventure of no great spiritual significance, a loose contract for the mutual provision of physiological conveniences or political aid. According to Seneca, Women numbered the years of their lives by the number of their husbands. They divorced to marry and married to divorce. Martial observed a woman who married ten husbands in the space of 30 days. According to the legal records of that time, 30% of upper-class marriages ended in divorce in the first century, and while we can't be certain about the lower class, most historians believe that they followed the example of the upper class where 30% of marriages ended in divorce. That was the state of marriage and divorce among the Romans. Now, among the Jews, things were a little different. The Jews' view of divorce came down to a disagreement between two prominent Jewish rabbis, Hillel and Shimei. You might remember Deuteronomy chapter 24, a man could divorce his wife if he found some uncleanness in her. And as I Acknowledged a few minutes ago, what exactly that phrase means is a little unclear. Hillel and Shimei set out to define what exactly God meant when he said some uncleanness. Hillel's interpretation became the conventional wisdom in Jesus' day. Hillel believed a man could divorce his wife for any reason. Shimei, though, had a much different view of divorce. He believed that divorce could occur for a few specific reasons. Shimei believed some uncleanness could be defined in three ways. If a marriage was infertile, the partners could divorce. God commanded his people to fill the earth, be fruitful and multiply and subdue it. So according to Shimei, if a couple was unable to produce a child within the first 10 years of their marriage, they were permitted to divorce and remarry in the hopes that the next union would produce a child. Shimei also taught that a man could divorce his wife for reasons of adultery, per Numbers chapter 5, verses 11 through 31. And Shimei also believed that a woman could divorce her husband if he neglected her along the lines of Exodus chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. If a husband deprived his wife of food, clothing, or conjugal rights, that woman was free to divorce her husband. So Hillel had a very broad view of divorce. Shimei was much more narrow. In Jesus' day, Hillel's view of divorce was the prevailing view among the Jews the no fault or divorce for any reason, which takes us into the teachings of Jesus on the topic of marriage and divorce. One of those passages is Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9. In that passage, Jesus returns us to God's original design for marriage. The reason he does so is in response to a question. Some Pharisees ask him, "'Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason?' It looks to me like the Pharisees were gauging how Jesus would compare with Hillel. Can a man divorce his wife for any reason? Jesus quotes Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. We talked about that a few minutes ago. And he concludes, Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate, which appears to condemn the entire practice of divorce. So the Pharisees want to know, why did Moses even permit divorce? Jesus says it was because of the hardness of men's hearts. Now that's a tough, but it's a fair appraisal of the practice of divorce. Divorce generally occurs because either one or both parties have become hard-hearted toward the other. But as Jesus notes, this was not God's intention from the beginning. He intended folks to remain married until one spouse died. So Jesus had a much more narrow view than the one taught among the Jews, even the view taught by Shimei. Now, Jesus does permit divorce if one spouse commits adultery. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, Jesus says, Whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. According to Jesus, adultery is the only acceptable grounds for divorce, which means 
Adultery is involved in a divorce no matter what. Either adultery is the grounds for the divorce or it is the result of a remarriage. So unlike Shimei, who added infertility and neglect to his list of permissible grounds, Jesus limits the grounds for divorce at one. He limits it to adultery. Now Paul echoed the teachings of Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In verse number 10, he says, Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Paul is referring to the teachings of Jesus. As an apostle, he had received the teachings of Jesus by the direction of the Holy Spirit. Paul goes on to say, A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. Paul said Jesus advocated a husband and wife should remain together. If they separate or divorce, they should not remarry. They should seek reconciliation. And that really is the message of the New Testament. Divorce should be exceedingly rare, and it should happen for good reasons. If it does not happen for good reasons, then divorced spouses should seek reconciliation. Now, as I draw this to a close, I know I have left a few questions on the table. I've left a few questions unanswered. What about when a woman or her children are abused by her husband? Does God permit divorce under those circumstances? What about a Christian spouse who is married to a non-Christian? Should he or she remain married? Is it okay for someone to remarry if their previous marriage ended for reasons other than adultery? I plan to address those questions in a future episode, but I've run out of time for this particular episode. As we close, I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to hold fast to what Jesus has taught on this topic. American culture is constantly shifting on the topic of marriage and divorce, and I encourage you to hold true to what the Bible teaches. And I'll leave you with some words from the book of Hebrews. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines.